Now I'm going to continue with the multidisciplinary team and implementation, nearly the first step of to uh, start with the ERAS protocols. So um, as you know, in, according to the numbers of WHO, the complication rate in whole operations is about 25%. It's high. And the death rate is one over 20. So it's again, not a very small uh, number. And usually half of those uh, problems reasons are adverse events based on surgical reasons. And the most important point out that is half is preventable. So that's why the healthcare systems are in a kind of evolution. So we, we used to work on the volume-based type of surgery. We were crazy doing more and more operations. Uh, okay, so if the patient doesn't die, then there is no problem we were thinking, but now it, the system is improving on the patient tailor and value-based models. So this is, I think, the next step and then the idea of the future of the surgery. So the first step we need to reach is the form of a multidisciplinary team approach. And it's not easy because if you want to start an ERAS program, it covers a list of participants, starting from nurses, surgeons, anesthesiology, intensivists, and so on. So the, everybody should work cohesively and understand the culture and should be motivated to you know, apply those kind of process to increase the success rate. So as Max said, in the ERAS Cardiac homepage, you can find any type of uh, turnkeys or information about the implementation process. So basically, uh, since we need to try to use these value-based concepts into our clinical practice, and to keep on and just reaching on this uh, quality improvement and work with the heart team. So this team is a large team, not easy to work together, but this is the base of the success. So basically we are using patient specific protocols and within the multidisciplinary team approach. So this was the paper published again with the ERAS Cardiac Society about the 10 commandments of ERAS for cardiac surgery. And number one, is to create a cohesive and multidisciplinary team. So, and then Mike just mentioned all about the new consensus report. And in this report, uh, the program implementation and sustainment is cited as a moderate uh, important point to include in the ERAS. As I've told you, you can find those documents in the ERAS Cardiac uh, Society homepage. So to start with the ERAS Cardiac team, um, the idea is to find a kind of program coordinator. So this is the most important step. And so then, then you should all come together to agree on the interventions. And of course, these all should be applied to your own current practices and opportunities. So this is the most important point. For example, when we start the program in our clinic, we translated the guidelines from English to Turkish but that was not enough. So we also adapted those ideas into Turkish lifestyle. And then you have to utilize the database. So always you need to talk with data to increase the power to impact of our, your practice. And of course, should everyone come together to discuss the barriers and how to overcome them and to find people who can solve those kind of problems. So because there will be many problems related to patient or related to staff, and even related to your own practice inside the hospital. So the timeline is, can be different from one center to another. For example, in our center, we had a very um, long uh, experience of the patient lab management program that was built up like six years ago. So it was comparatively easier for us to start to the ERAS program. But of course, you can just fix a kind of timeline for you and try to just go on within this timeline procedure. So ERAS is a mainly a concept, especially in cardiac surgery, is a multi-model. We are always saying this, but of course, they are not easy to come together and do all of this uh, teamwork, like multi-model, transdisciplinary initiative and promote the recovery. So you have to make easier the patient journey, starting before surgery and going home, and even after being discharged. So we started the protocol at the end of 2020 in our hospital, and we now did about more than 1,000 cases. So it's a large hospital. So we, the idea was to start the founding a kind of team. 
So we organized a consensus meeting and invited all people, all participants in the ERAS community and discuss how can we start this program, what are the barriers, what can we do, but who needs to be the program leader or so. And then we started educational programs with the selected group, even national and international educators come to teach us and to organize the group. And then we formed a large team because it's a large hospital with 4,000 beds, 12 operating rooms in cardiac. And then protocol. So it was difficult, as I've told you. We translated the protocols, we modified them. We just visited every participant's clinic to understand what are the barriers. And this is the uh, final protocol that we started. So ERAS guideline that was published in 2019 uh, offers 22 recommendations, and we nearly tried to cover all of them. So this is the video, brief video of what we have done or what are we doing now. So as I've told you, we work in one of the largest hospitals in the area. It was nearly, uh, nearly built in 2019. Uh, we have four, around 4,000 beds, 750 uh, ICU beds. There's six towers, each was focused on something else. The one tower is in cardiac. So we have very uh, new technology equipment and beds and wards. So this is the prehabilitation program. So when the patient decided to have a surgery, comes to our fellow, he describes everything, signs the paper, gives information, sends to the dietitian. So the dietitian sees the patient do all kinds of measurements and biochemistry to understand the nutrition status of the patients before surgery. And 15% of our patients are already malnourished before surgery. So she helps them, gives them additional products. And then if she has, or he has anemia, we treat them with the item before being in the hospital. And then patient comes back to the hospital. Again, some paperwork, additional information. And dietitian does a ward round twice every day. And then before surgery, we do carbohydrate loading to deal with the insulin resistance. Neurocognitive evaluation is always evaluated by the anesthesiologist. So this is the operative protocol. Before surgery, as I've told you, especially if you're doing minimally invasive surgery, it's incredibly painful. So we routinely do blocks before surgery. If the sternotomy will be done, then the first thing to do is the erector spina block. Of course, this took a lot of time to uh, establish this protocol in a routine case. And then if the saphenous wing will be harvested, then saphenous block will be done. So this really goes on a lot of a long five to six hours that it's helpful for us. And of course, monitorization is very important in these patients, as just already mentioned, um, goal-directed uh, fluid treatment, goal-directed perfusion, and if, if there is a bleeding, goal-directed coagulation is important. If we are doing minimally invasive surgery, again, the pain is important, so we always put a catheter before sending the patient to the ICU. And in the operating room, we use what whatever we have, like hemoadsorption, uh, endoscopic vein harvesting, MIEC, of course, and autotransfusion. And this is the minimally invasive techniques we are doing. And again, uh, bleeding is important. So we use some topical hemostatic agents with some specific applicators within the small incisions. And of course, we try to use every additional technique to decrease the cross clamp time, CPB time. I'll use some sutureless valves, um, some different incisions for valve surgery. And ICU is another important place, especially physiotherapy is very important. So we have dedicated physiotherapists for the patients. And of course, neurocognitive follow-up is always very important in the long term. And then we follow up those patients at home. So we started using this remote monitorization. It's a new device. So you can monitor even how many steps the patient has taken inside his home. 
So they can send us SMS message anytime they like to ask something. I have this symptom or I have this problem. So, and the results are very much promising in the early results. As I've told you, we didn't know anything before uh, about nutrition before this type of protocol. And we documented that 15% of patients are already in malnutrition when they come to us. And during the perioperative period, we needed to do for 45% of patients some additional nutritional support. So this was a new concept for us. So for the implementation, as I've told you, we have a teamwork experience with PBM that's helped us very much. We have experience in minimally invasive surgery and MIEC helped us very much. We have some previous um, reports and research about delirium that really helped us. And of course, we have some, uh, again, uh, some techniques for the infectious pickup and help us sternal closure. And for the challenges, we, we did know nothing about nutrition. And so we really had a lot of training. We tried, we learned many things about nutrition. Non-opioid anesthesia, we knew nothing about it when we start this program. And physiotherapy was not that much important for us before starting this program. So with the transition, we need to come to the value-based models, patient-tailored model models with the um, really um, multidisciplinary team approach. These are all very difficult concepts. So when they come together, we always have a success. So minimally invasive ACC is one of the most important hallmarks of this program. And again, ERAS, I believe, will be the uh, future uh, way of handling patients. So as being in Greece, so I'm going to talk about the handmaids of Aphrodite. And she has three hand, uh, maids. The one is Joy, the other is Splendor, and the third one is Bloom. So each one of them should be included in the RS protocols. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sirdar. I, I think that I, I, I was very intrigued by the identification that 15% of your patients are malnourished preoperatively. And that certainly has been an observation that we've made independently looking at, you know, individual patients. Uh, but again, this is a real opportunity to try to identify. Uh, and I think the, uh, the involvement of the dietitian, not only in the preoperative assessment, but ongoing will help change lifestyle in the long term to, you know, ensure that the patient has a, has a, a very active uh, and successful recovery. Uh, but uh, yes. it's very successful. That, that, that's, that's very good watching this come yeah. into practice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Professor, uh, you mentioned about the chief of the uh, group. This is very important in order to cooperate all the team. Uh, in our practice, we are not uh, follow exactly. We do not follow all the parameters exactly, strictly. Uh, we screen them, uh, we are uh, looking about uh, hemoglobin or albumin before surgery uh, and all the other parameters are uh, each one uh, separately. Mm -hmm. we, are, uh, we do not uh, uh, implement all of the protocols now and this is something challenging for us. Yeah, it's probably the most important part, but you know, the most challenging part, as you say, of course. Thank you. Thank you. So we go on with Ron Selinger. Again, he's a cardiac surgeon in the US and he has good experience in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. And he has some kind of experience, I believe, on MIEX systems. And he's going to give us talk on um, intraoperative, very high, Ron. How are you? <laughs> 